You know, when we first began this conference, it was kind of exciting because uh, the director of our ministry goes to this church because her husband is the pastor. And so when I first got here, Don said, uh, I need to talk with you. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, I think Lynn is, is losing her hearing. I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, I'm not sure. I said, well, why don't you find out? Well, how do I do that? I said, well, just catch your back to you sometime. Stand off about 30 feet and say, honey, do you have the keys to the car? And if you get no response, move into 20 feet. No response, 10 and so forth. So that happened just a little bit later. Stood off about 30 feet and said, uh, Lynn, do you have the keys to the car? No response. Moved into 20 feet. Honey, do you have the keys to the car? No response. Moved into 10 feet. None. Right behind her. Honey, do you have the keys to the car? And Lynn turned around and said, Don, what in the world is wrong with you? I told you five times I didn't. Are you hard of hearing or what? <laughs> Now there illustrates the great dilemma of life. Boy, I wish somebody else was here to hear this. Uh, uh, you're here. <laughs> I, I was a young pastor and I was called over to this church, uh, to this house, I should say. Uh, and uh, it was a young couple doing battle. Uh, boy, uh, this is the kind of house call policemen don't like to make. And so when I got there, I played referee for about two hours. It was like watching a giant ping pong match. Boing, 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 boing. And after about two hours, I said, hey, come up for some air, would you? And, and uh, put on some coffee and give me a piece of paper and pencil. And they did. This is what I drew them uh, when they came back. Actually, that's a lie. I drew them stick figures. But uh, <laughs> I said, listen, before God, I said, you're responsible for your own character and the other person's needs. Listen to Romans 14.4. Who am I to judge the servant of another? To his own master he will stand and fall. And stand he will, because God is able to make him stand. And look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. It says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than yourself. Have this attitude which was also in Christ Jesus. I said, do you know what you've been doing now for the last two hours? You've been ripping the other person's character, looking out for your own needs. I said, there is no way any kind of a relationship can function that way. Now, reason with me here for a moment. What would happen if everybody in our churches and our Christian homes around us committed themselves to God's great goal, which is to conform to his image. In other words, I'm going to be responsible for my own character, and everybody sought to love one another, essentially then, to commit themselves to meet one another's needs. And everybody did that. What would life be like? Well, that's probably what heaven is going to be like. Now, surely that's true. I've never had anybody question that, that that is not uh, uh, our biblical responsibilities. So why isn't it happening? Now, we want to look at this dynamic of our relationships. Before we do, let me point out an interesting thing in Scripture. We are told that no person can fully look upon God. I don't believe we could in our mortal bodies. I think we have to receive a resurrected body someday. Then only then can we probably stand in the presence of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So man, no, no man fully has. But there were times where some unusual people in the Bible got an extra dose of God's presence. In other words, they were somehow ushered into a, the presence of God or saw God in a way that mere mortals typically don't. Now, one of them was Moses, and he actually asked for it, show me thy glory. And the Lord stuck him in a cleft of a rock, and he got the world's first afterglow. And you know the story. So radiated his countenance, his just face glowed for a while with the presence of God. Isaiah saw God. And what happened? Actually, he saw a train of the robe of God in, in the temple. He saw a partial manifestation, not fully God. What happened? Well, he fell down on his face and depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. I'm a man of unclean lips, is what he said. Now, my point is very simple. If you were living very close to God, whose sin would you be aware of? It would be your own, and only your own, I would say. New Testament, Peter's out fishing all night, doesn't catch a thing. And he comes in, and he's mending his nets, and the Lord's talking to him by the seaside. And the Lord said to Peter, this time I want you to go out and try it again, but throw your nets off the other side of the boat. 
well, this side, that side, same old lake, right? Anyway, so he's obedient. He goes out and starts pulling in fish. It's like a light bulb went on. This guy calls fish. Who can call fish? It's like he's suddenly aware who's in the boat with him. And he falls down and says, depart from me. I'm married to a sinful woman. <laughs> Didn't sound right, did it? Well, it's not right. I'm a, a sinful man. You see, that's the point. If we were living, practicing the presence of God, folks, we wouldn't be looking at other people's sins. We would be aware of our own. Oh, yeah, but I've got the ministry of condemnation. <laughs> no, you have the ministry of reconciliation, not counting their sins against them. Hmm. Ah, but love exposes a multitude of sins. <laughs> What's it do? It covers a multitude of sins. It's amazing how we turn that around. Now, what are these dynamics in terms of our relationship? First of all, let me ask the question. What right do I have to expect anything from somebody else? Is that a right that I have? What right do I have as a husband to expect my wife to be submissive to me? Is that a right that I have? Or do I have a responsibility to love my wife as Christ loved the church? Let's go one step further. What right do I have as a parent to expect my children to obey me, for instance? Is that a right that I have? Or do I have a responsibility to train my child up in the Lord and discipline them if they are disobedient? It's like one husband says, well, I have my rights around here. I'm the head of this house. Ah, shut up. I said, don't you realize that being the head of the home is not a right to be demanded. It's an awesome responsibility that I'm going to have to stand before God someday and give an account for. Now, here's my point. It's very simple. See, I believe in the inalienable rights. In other words, everybody has a right to be respected regardless of race, color, and creed. I would defend that strongly. But here's what's happening. We start emphasizing our rights over our responsibilities, and we're going down. There's no way a culture or a group could survive that kind of an orientation. And yet that's happening. Pursuing our individual rights so strongly that we're just abdicating our responsibilities. You can have a lady seven months pregnant, demanding her right over her own body, calling for an abortion, and even when science says that's not a part of your body, but she's demonstrated her irresponsible use of it to everybody. We don't have an abortion problem. We have an irresponsible sex problem. And because they've been irresponsible in that, they want to be abdicated from any responsibility of that. And it's just tragic what's happened. We're so far removed from what the real problem is, we can't even hardly address that because I got my rights. Well, it's kind of tragic. I really have learned in my own life, I don't expect anything from anybody. I don't even think that's my right. I just try to focus on my responsibility, try to become the husband and father that God wants me to be. It's amazing uh, how that essentially frees up the rest of my family then to uh, be obligated to their own responsibilities before God as well. Now, the second issue we want to look at here is what way should we or shouldn't we be another person's conscience? Now, I'm not going to dwell on this for very long because I'm sure you already know the answer. Leave it alone. Trust God to be the convictor of sins. That's not my job. I remember years ago, I gave my wife to the Lord. And I said, here, Lord, she's all yours. You deal with her. And you ought to see the beauty I got back. <laughs> and I just, I just stopped trying to play the role of the Holy Spirit. No, let me tell you why. When you back off and let God have a direct shot at that person, <laughs> uh, a lot more things good happen than if you try to play that role of God in somebody else's life. The moment you do it, what happens is, you misdirect your, that person's battle with God onto yourself, and you're inadequate for the task. Mine is to love, build up, accept, affirm, uh, do those kind of things. And then it frees that other person up. And it actually uh, allows God to have a better access to these people's lives. Now, here's a big issue. How should we relate to other people in uh, reference to their character and their behavior and uh, how does this relate to acceptance, judgment, and discipline? Now, let me share where the tension is here. We are commanded not to judge one another, correct? But discipline is a proof of our love. Now, what's the difference? Now, before we look at that, let me uh, draw another issue out here. 
There is a, a need for all of us to live in conscious agreement before God, to confess our sins and to find His cleansing and forgiveness. But when you deal with people and helping others as well as yourself, which is harder to say? I did it. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Which is harder to say? <laughs> it's I did it. You know, we kind of brush over confession as a simple concept, but in relating to one another, just owning up to our own responsibilities. Suppose I catch my son throwing a rock at a car. Carl, you just threw a rock at the car. No, I didn't. Well, Carl, I saw you with... No, I didn't. Come on, Carl, I saw you with my... You threw a rock at that car. I'm sorry. What are you sorry for, son? Well, you know. Carl, what are you sorry for? Oh, Dad, would you forgive me? Oh, sure, son. What for? Well, you know. It's incredibly hard for some people to say, I did it. I've seen that in adult relationships. They go up to a friend they're struggling with and say, you know, I don't think things are right between you and I right now. Uh, so I, I just would like to ask your forgiveness. Well, sure. What for? Well, you know what's going on between you and I right now. But what is it specifically that you would like me to forgive you for? Well, forget it then. It's amazing how hard it is to say for some people, I did it, I did it. It was my fault was, and I was wrong. Well, moving on to this now in terms of character and judgment. Now, character is always related uh, to judgment, whereas behavior is related to discipline. Now, the critical difference here is very, very important. Let me explain something about discipline first. Discipline is different from punishment. Punishment is like eye for eye. It's retroactive. It's getting even. It's revenge in one sense. I punished you uh, for something that you've done. That's not discipline. Because discipline is not retroactive. It's actually future oriented. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, If you're not being disciplined by God, you are an illegitimate child of God. God loves those that he disciplines. And later on it says, no discipline for the time seems to be joyful. We'd all agree with that. But afterwards, it produces the spiritual fruit of righteousness. In other words, why does he discipline me? So I can share in his holiness. It's a future orientation. He's shaping my character and my behavior in the process of doing that. Even the concept of spanking is not punishment or retroactive. I'm spanking you so you don't do it again. I'm trying to shape your behavior is what I'm doing for the future. And oftentimes, we are, are doing work that is nothing more than revenge, eye for eye, punishment. But perfect love has cast out fear because fear involves punishment. So if I love my child, I'm going to discipline them. But the whole intention of that is to shape future behavior and help develop his character for the future. That's what it's supposed to be. Now, the difference between judgment and, uh, and discipline. Suppose I catch my son telling a lie. I say, Carl, what you just said right now isn't true. You're judging me. Am I judging him? No, there's no judgment there at all. There never is in discipline because it's, it's based on observation. I saw you do it. I heard you say it. I'm just referring back to the behavior. But now what if I said, son, you're a liar. What's that? That's character. That's character assassination is what it really is. Now, what can he do about that? Uh, he can say, oh, you're right, and somehow I'm going to grow up and never do it again. But you can't instantly change your character. You can commit yourself to grow, but you can uh, point out a person's behavior, what you said right now isn't true, and it can be resolved right now. You're right, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done it, uh, would you forgive me? It's over with, folks. I haven't attacked that person's character. Uh, unfortunately, much of what has been done in the name of discipline has been nothing more than character assassination. Stupid, dumb, clumsy. Oh, dear Christian, uh, you need to realize the damage that that has done. I have seen adults who are still struggling because of childhood experiences. Our, one of our Canadian directors was doing a conference and. And as he approached the board to set up the whole uh, conference somewhat in the future, one of the older members was 
Again, it. I'm against it. We don't need that in our church. Well, they overvoted him and they had it anyhow. To everybody's surprise, he came, sat in the back, arms folded. Uh, it was all on video. I don't know if he's going to throw a rock at the screen or what. But anyway, halfway through, Robert was a very gracious man, our Canadian director, and, and he said, um, uh, Sir, I'm, I'm counseling a young man this afternoon, and I need a prayer partner. Would you sit in? Well, okay. You know, kind of came to inspect, I suppose. Turned out that afternoon, Robert had the privilege to lead this young man to freedom in Christ. And when it was over with, this dear old man came to Robert and said, Would you do that for me? But I don't want anybody sitting in there. Well, he said, I'd have to stay over an extra day to do that. And he said, well, would you please? He said, okay, I'll do that. Saturday of that week, he went to the young man and said, I was a prayer partner for you. Would you be a prayer partner for me? And that Sunday afternoon, that 70-year-old man finally came to terms with the verbal abuse of his own father. He carried that bitterness for years and years and years and years. Never knew any sense of personal freedom himself and finally let it go. I've sat with hundreds and hundreds of people and saw them make a list of who they need to forgive. 95% of the time, the first two people mentioned are mom and dad. It isn't that they're the worst monsters in this world. They are the primary significant others in the developmental years of their life. And most of it is just right there, just the verbal abuse, the put down. You know, honestly, mom and dad, if we have attacked our children's character like that, we got an obligation before God and for the sake of our children to go ask them forgiveness. What you've done is wrong. I've often thought, that if we could memorize just one verse of the Bible and put it into practice, half our problems would dissolve overnight in our homes and our churches. Go hang yourself. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> wanted to see if you're awake. <laughs> Ephesians 4.29 Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth except for that which gives edification according to the need of the moment that you may give grace to the hearer. Let no unwholesome word. Now, if you think it's easy to obey that commandment, try it with your children. I had my kids when they were about 10 and 12 memorize that verse, and every time I violated it, they had to go put a mark on a board. We painted four walls of the house that way, and, uh, and why is that so hard to carry that out? You know what the next verse is? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It grieves God when He sees us use our words to put down people he's trying to build up. What happens if somebody attacks our character? How should we respond to that? Should we be defensive? Well, I guarantee you, every time you're going to be tempted to. My answer is, by the grace of God, no. My model, of course, again, is Christ. He was dumb before his accusers. First Peter chapter 2 says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. It's hard, but it's, it's Christ-like to do that. Now, I believe there's two reasons why we shouldn't be defensive. Number one, if you're right, you don't need a defense. That's the hard one. If you're wrong, you don't have one. <laughs> but let's go back to the first one, because frankly, that's the hard one. Let's say somebody wrongly attacks your character. Should we be defensive? Now, it takes the grace of God not to respond in kind like that. But let me give you an illustration. I remember uh, when I first started in ministry, uh, we had a large college ministry, and they asked me to, to pick up high school. Now, high school in this church had about 250 kids, so it was a, it was a big high school ministry. And uh, it had a Pioneer Girls Club program. Now, the director of it, I thought, was a friend of mine. And so my theory is if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right? So I left it alone. Now, in hindsight, that was a mistake. I should have made some appointment and had some time with her to see how everything was going. I just assumed it was. Bad assumption. It wasn't going well. In fact, uh, she was pretty much under fire, apparently, at that time. And a lot of people need a scapegoat, I guess. And some people think it's the pastor who should be that. So uh, she made an appointment with me. And she came in, almost ripped the doorknob off doing it, and said, Pastor Neil, I sat up last night and I made a list of things for you and things against you. Man, I look at that piece of paper and there's a line drawn down the middle. The four column had only had one dinky little item in it. And the against went all the way down the bottom and it said over. <laughs> and, uh, so I said, well, give me the four first. That didn't take very long. And then she started down the against column. 
Now, I've got to be honest with you. The part of me that's made of earth wanted to respond to every one of those allegations. Fortunately, the part of me that's made of God said, keep your mouth shut. And so she got way out to the end of the list, went through, went through the whole list. There was an awkward silence, about two and a half years. And, um, and finally, I said, well, ma'am, I must have taken you a lot of courage to come in and share that with me. What do you suggest I do? Another little pause, and finally she started, oh, it isn't you, it's me. Right. I didn't say that. <laughs> I may have thought it, but I didn't say it. Now, my point is, is that when she's at the end of that list, you've got to understand an important dynamic here. Her gun is empty. The last thing you want to do is to hand her some more ammunition. <laughs> you know, but it's a magical moment when, when somebody has took their best shot at you, found every little character defect you have. You know, where do you go from there? There's no more ammunition. It's really an interesting dynamic at that moment. What I've learned, if you won't be defensive, there's a very good chance you're going to have an opportunity to turn around and have a ministry because, the, because what she's doing, first of all, essentially is wrong. Uh, I've learned an interesting secret in life is, is that nobody, no mature person puts down another person. Mature people don't do that. You don't see Swindoll and Dobson sitting out bad-mouthing other people in ministry. They're hurting people. Now, if you can just believe that for a moment, it's really helped me over the years. It helps in how you respond to them. They're hurting people. Now, what would have happened if I would have attempted to have defended myself in any one of those allegations? Well, I'm sure she would have become even more convinced that it was her duty to convince me that I was not yet qualified to be a member of the Trinity. <laughs> now, that was something I already knew being married. And uh, what actually happened was is that we ended up praying together in two weeks Later, she resigned her position, and everybody was happy. One of my students uh, heard that illustration in class at Talbot a few years back, and I think it was about six months after that, he came by my office and said, thank you for that illustration. Oh, I said, why? Oh, he said, uh, I've been doing a long-term substitutionary teaching uh, role at a local school, and one night this irate parent called me and said, you're the worst teacher my daughter's ever had. Just ripped me up and down, left and right. And I just did what you did. I just listened and finally said, well, ma'am, it must take a lot of courage to call me. What do you suggest I do? Guess what happened? She started to cry. Well, it turned out to be a single parent who uh, had a very rebellious daughter, and who knows what that daughter was coming home and sharing, and it turned out she was even a Christian. And what actually happened was they ended up discussing together how they could win this girl back to Christ and end up praying together and maintaining contact with each other. Now, there's another aspect of this story I want to share with you. Mom and Dad, when your child comes home and shares something about the youth pastor at church or, or the school teacher at school, give some benefit of the doubt. Proverbs says everybody sounds just and pleading their own case until their neighbor comes and sets them straight. Now, I'm not saying that you don't stand behind your child. You really should where it's appropriate. But you haven't heard the other side of the story. And you ought to take the time to do that. We had a, a man in our church, actually was an elder in our church, and my youth pastor caught his daughter with drugs. We attempted to try to deal with that ourselves at first, but uh, we told her if we caught her again, we'd have to call her father. Well, we did. And unfortunately, it didn't turn out very well. Uh, in fact, uh, my youth pastor set up an appointment time, and right in front of his daughter, uh, who was later excused, but right in front of his daughter, he started to rip my youth pastor. It was just incredible. And, and finally, she had left, the daughter left. And, and uh, Dennis, bless his heart, just loved kids, loved the Lord, and looked at this dear man and said, uh, Sir, I'll make a deal with you. What's that? Well, if you will agree to believe only half of what your daughter's told you about me, then I'll agree to believe only half of what your daughter has told me about you. That ended that conversation. <laughs> the point of it is, is, is hear the other side. And I think we all need to be willing to do that. Is this easy, not being defensive? Oh, dear Christian, everybody, everybody wants to attack somebody's character. I mean, it's part of the fallen world that we're living in. But again, let me suggest to you, we're supposed to bless those who curse us, pray for those who mistreat us. Not an easy thing to do, but it's very Christ-like. You say, have you ever been under attack? Oh, come on. <laughs> 
You know, I've learned a principle. Let me just share it with you. I call it the principle of the whale. Remember this. When you rise to the top and begin to blow, that's when you get harpooned. <laughs> you know, the hills of curses and blessing, they seem to just kind of rise together. I was doing a chapel one time and focused on the family, and Dobson wasn't that, there that day because of death threats. I mean, so, you know, the more good you do, the, more, the bigger target you are, by and large. And so it kind of equals out. Uh, along the line. Well, second point here, there's four words here I want you to look at in your syllabus. First one is authority. Authority, accountability, affirmation, acceptance. Now look carefully at that list. Let me ask you a critical question. Your answer to this will say an awful lot how we'd understand ministry and parenting. From which end of that list does God come to you and I? Now, let's start off with the truth. There is established authority. There is a tremendous need today, as there always has been, for accountability. But from which end of that list did God come to you or I? Well, to save time, it's acceptance, folks. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Then came the affirmation, beloved, now you are a child of God. Here's what I've discovered. I hope you have as well. When the authority figure demands accountability without affirmation or acceptance, you'll never get it. Oh, they may fill out a form or answer some superficial questions, but you'll never find out what's going on. That's really true for parenting. Let's say your, your child is way late and come home, and you say, Where were you? Out. What were you doing? Tell me, folks. You know, if, if uh, some big person came and said that to you, that's how you'd respond to, <laughs> by and large. Uh, but, but that's true. It's true in ministry. It's everywhere I've been. Interestingly enough, when somebody knows that they're accepted and affirmed, they will voluntarily be accountable to the authority figure. Voluntarily. That's in ministry. That's in parenting, I've discovered. You know, Paul has kind of the reputation in some quarters. I don't agree with it, but... Uh, of being kind of the macho, left brain, aerospace engineer, uh, theologian of the New Testament. I mean, haven't we got that? You know, you ought to remain single, or if you can't, you know, I don't want you to burn, so go ahead and get married. And, and um, you know, women ought to be submissive to their husbands, and a lot of that comes from Paul. So let's skip over to John. And he's kind of the soft guy. And I want to share another side to Paul. I, I think we can miss it so easily. Paul was on his uh, first missionary journey, went to Thessalonica, he was there three weeks and was run out of town. On his second letter back to them, uh, uh, he reflects on that, but the first letter that he wrote to them after that experience, only there for three weeks, he bases the whole credibility on this letter as to how he conducted himself while he was there. And listen to what he says. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we see glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. In other words, we did have the authority. But we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you become very dear to us. Wow parted to you not only the gospel, but my own life. We have the authority. I, I love the, the image of Christ in this whole area. Have you ever read anywhere in the gospels where Jesus said essentially this, listen you people, shape up because I'm God. Isn't that interesting? He was God. And after he gave the Sermon on the Mount, they all observed him and said, well this man speaks as one who has authority. And he had no ecclesiastical position at all. Wasn't a member of the Sanhedrin, wasn't an affair, nothing. And yet he spoke to them because of the quality and the conduct and the character of their life. Same thing applies for leadership today. We shall not lord it over them. We shall prove to be an example amongst them. The authority that we carry has to be based in our character. That's why every qualification to be a leader in the church is all based on character and who we are. Should we express our needs? Is that legitimate? 
if you have a need that you perceive isn't being is it all right to express that need? I think it is. I really do. Uh, I don't think we should leave that for a matter of guess. If you're a hurting person, I think you, you need to identify that so, so legitimate help can come. I, I just don't think that you can assume everybody is so incredibly right with God, so spiritual that, that uh, they're going to perfectly be led by the Holy Spirit and all our needs will be met through the body of Christ and our relationship with Him. So I think it's legitimate. The problem is that it isn't always expressed as a need. Sometimes it comes out as a judgment. And a wife may say, she uh, isn't being loved, and say, you don't love me anymore, do you? You know what you're going to get with that one? Yeah, I do. <laughs> you see, the problem of it is, instead of saying, I don't feel loved, you put it off as, you don't love me anymore. Now watch what happens, you see. If we're under the authority of God, and responsible for our own character, loving one another, but when it breaks down, and you just see a couple really going at it, it will look a little like this. <laughs> I've just had it. I, I feel so unloved. Listen, I'm sorry, okay, you know. Well, you should be. Oh, good grief. You had it going and you lost it. Isn't that interesting? How fast that turns around? I said, express it as a need. It's legitimate to express it as a need. Allow then the Holy Spirit to bring conviction in the other person's life. I'll tell you what, if it's continued to express as a need and you don't take on the responsibility of their character or charge them for not doing what they should or shouldn't be doing, boy, I'm telling you, an incredible amount of conviction is going to start to rise. <laughs> Actually, I've had to tell people, I said, you do that at first, you may not like the immediate response. Uh, because it's like the, a guilt blame scale exists within us and all of a sudden you take away the guilt scale goes like this and so they may nitpick for a while but after a while they just can't live that way and uh, so let it work out don't don't be uh, uh, frustrated with the immediate response for one or two days or so but it's all getting back to assuming our own responsibilities now what needs do all of us have everybody here needs to be loved Everybody here needs to be accepted and affirmed. Actually, as I go around, let me just help our congregations here. As I talk to pastors, you know, really all over the world, missionaries, I, I just perceive their number one need is affirmation. Tell me I'm doing all right. You know, don't keep telling me where I'm falling short. Write me a nice little letter. Tell me I'm doing okay. Boy, that just works wonders in people's lives. Why don't you leave this conference tonight and go home and call somebody that's not here and just say, Hey, Charlie, I just want you to know, you're a credit to the community. Every time I'm around you, you build me up and, and affirm me. I just want to thank you so much. God bless you and hang up. And the wife will say, Who was that? Well, I don't know, a crank call, I think it was. And, uh, <laughs> you see, why don't we make that call? Are you waiting for somebody to call you? It may never come. You know, one of the little secrets of life is, is that you get out of life what you put into it. If you want a friend, be a friend. Want somebody to love you? Love somebody. It's as simple as that. It's more blessed to give than to receive because the more you give. I had an old man who was a machine gun instructor in the First World War. I don't know what that says about me or him, but man, he was old. When he came to my church, he was the oldest man ever baptized. And one day he walked out and handed me a little note. And on the little note it said, it is one of life's great compensations that you cannot sincerely help another person without in the same time sincerely helping yourself. I really believe that's true. Uh, it is one of life's great compensations that the more you love, the more you be loved. The more you give, the more you receive back. Uh, one of the secrets I learned, I wish I could tell the whole story, but I was in the Navy and I, I learned... Uh, well, I, I don't know. I, just one of the keys, I think, to living a successful life is this. Whatever life asks of you, give just a little bit more. If you're supposed to be at work at 8 o'clock, show up about 10 to a quarter till. You won't get run over in the parking lot that way, if nothing else. It's, it's just amazing what that does. Whatever life asks of you, give just a little bit more. You see, there was a time in the military, it was do enough, you know, for government work. Uh, which meant just enough to keep the old sergeant off your back. Well, folks, I had the privilege to work in the Apollo space program, and uh, we had the guidance system for the lunar lander, and that thing had to be tested for a year under shock and vibration and heat temperature and, and in close tolerances. We could not allow that to fail because a mission was at stake. 
Three lives were at stake. Well, let's do enough to keep God off our back. Do enough for church work. Oh, Christian, there's a mission at stake. Human lives around the world at stake. That's not sufficient enough. But it's such a simple little thing. I didn't realize how, at that time how biblical that is. You know the passage in Luke. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That which you measure out to others because measuring back to you. Now, I'm an old farm boy. I know exactly what he's talking about. Somebody wants a bushel of oats? Well, fill it up real gingerly. Take a two by four and scrape it off. That's a fair measure. What's he suggesting? Oh, shake it so it settles. Fill it up till it runs over. That which you measure out to others comes measuring back to you. It was like the baker and the farmer had an agreement. They would exchange uh, weekly a pound uh, of butter for a pound loaf of bread. And the baker decided one day, you know, I can scrimp a little bit off, just a little bit off of each loaf. Who would know the difference? And my profits would increase, probably 10% or so. So he did that for a few months. Then when he realized his butter supply was starting to dwindle, so he confronted the old farmer. You're not bringing as much butter in as you used to. Well, he said, well, I'm doing what I've always done. What are you doing? Oh, I take my little scale and I put your pound loaf of bread on one side. It's like the missionary who came back from the field and was making a little extra money uh, painting houses. And one day he decided, you know what, I could thin down that paint. It's awfully thick. It doesn't need to be that thick. I could thin it down a little bit, probably save at least one gallon for every house. So he painted this whole house that way, stood back to admire it, and a voice came down from heaven and said, repaint and thin no more. <laughs> I'm forgiven. We had a little argument in our home one time. We had this little white poodle. We bought it before my first child was born, so he was family for about 10 years. And uh, we had a discussion one day, who loved Missy the most? And uh, Carl was out of the picture, because when he came around, the dog growled. So it was really kind of up to me, my wife, and my daughter. My daughter said, well, you know, I dress the dog up every afternoon, and I play with it. And, and Joanne said, well, I'm the one that feeds the dog, and I'm here all day with the dog. And, and I said, no, I think I do. So we had a little contest. What we did was, was that two people would stand at one end of the room and the other one would hold the dog at this end and release it and these two people would call for it. We each got our chance to plea at every station. Well, both times it come to me and when I released it, it went out about three feet and came back. <laughs> I won. Now, they couldn't understand that. I said, well, for crying out loud, I said, who said the dog wants to be dressed up? And just being here uh, isn't the issue. I said, you know, the secret to life is you've got to scratch where people itch. And there's about a spot an inch above his tail that as soon as that dog comes on, <laughs> I always thought if I could get my wife to greet me when I came home the way that dog did, <laughs> I'd go to sit down, flunk the dog, and it was powerful. You know, we've been here for a long time this week. Why don't you stand up for just a moment? Put your books down. And, uh, and turn that direction right over there and give the person in front of you a really good shoulder massage. Oh. Okay, turn around and go the other way for just a moment. <clears throat> Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Okay, thank you very much. Give yourself a hand on that one. Listen. <laughs> Titus says, teach your people to meet pressing needs that they wouldn't be unfruitful. That they wouldn't be unfruitful. That's what love is. God met my greatest need. I was dead in my trespasses and sin, and it cost him his life. And because of that, we can love as we've been loved. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for that. And we look to you, Lord, the one who will meet all of our needs according to our richness and glory. And God, what you have freely given, give us the grace to give to others as well. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.